What I hope to cover in this lecture is firstly just to go through the genetics of this condition. Then I would like to think about which of the endocrine glands are affected in this condition. And we will then focus on the treatment options that are available. In this part of the talk, I'm just going to focus on two of the endocrine glands, the pituitary and the parathyroid. And then later on in the day, I'm going to talk about the pancreas side of things. Okay? So, just to remind everyone what is affected in MEN1. So, there are three glands that are typically affected. And we say these are the three Ps. So, we've got the pituitary gland, we've got the parathyroid gland, and we've also got the pancreas gland. And commonly, most patients present with problems with the parathyroid gland first uh, before they get uh, problems with the other two glands. But it's not always like that. The majority of patients um, at presentation would have primary hyperparathyroidism. And I'll go into what that means um, in a bit. So a little bit about the history, which you may not be aware of. The condition was first uh, actually described in the early part of the 1900s. But the pathologist who actually described it didn't actually know it was part of the MEN1 syndrome. So there was an individual who had problems with the pituitary gland as well as problems with the parathyroid gland. And it wasn't up until the 1950s uh, that someone actually recognised that, that this could actually happen in families. Um, and you may have heard the, the term Verma syndrome. That's also um, linked to MEN1. It's, MEN1 is also called Verma <coughs> syndrome. And that is because... Uh, there was a, a physician in America who described this being a familial condition. It was not up until the late 1990s that the actual gene for MEN1 was discovered. So actually, over the last 20 years, uh, our genetics has allowed us to identify individuals uh, with the actual genetic uh, um, problem that occurs in MEN1. So what is um, the MEN1 gene. Well, the gene codes for a protein called menem, and this uh, is a tumour suppressor gene. So a tumour suppressor gene prevents uh, various cells in the body from actually growing further. So if there's a problem with the tumour suppressor gene, then the cells sort of divide more and more, and tumours can occur. And those tumours can occur in the parathyroid gland, the pituitary gland or the pancreatic gland. Okay. Now, 90 to 95% of patients who have the MEN1 syndrome will have a mutation or an abnormality in the MEN1 gene. There are some patients who have the MEN1 syndrome, those are the three Ps, but do not have a detectable genetic mutation we can find. And that's because other genes may be involved in this condition that we just cannot identify at this moment in time. And there's a lot of research going on to try to identify those other genes that can happen in this condition. So what is the MEN1 gene, or where is it located? So this is just the um, quick picture of the chromosomes in our body. So chromosomes contain genes that code for our proteins. And in the body, there are 23 chromosomes, which are listed here. And the MEN1 gene is located on chromosome 11. So some of you may have read the report that, that comes back uh, saying there is an abnormality in the MEN1 gene. And you may have seen the word 11Q13 on that report, and you may not have known what that means. <coughs> So the 11 part refers to the chromosome part, uh, and the Q part uh, refers to the part uh, of the 11 chromosome that is affected. So when we have chromosomes, we call this part the P part, and this part the Q part. And the MEN1 gene is located in the Q part of it. So it's 11Q13 where the abnormality occurs in MEN1. So how is it inherited? It's inherited in what we say is an autosomal dominant fashion, which means uh, that uh, there is a 50% chance uh, that it can be passed on through um, your children. 
and then your children have a 50% chance of passing it on to their children. And the reason behind that uh, is that uh, in a individual we have two um, what we call alleles. They are parts of the chromosome where the gene is located. And I've listed here the MEN1 gene. So where the square boxes are, the rectangles, is the MEN1 gene. And the one in white is the abnormal gene. So in this individual, who is a male individual, the individual is affected because the, the patient has one gene, which is the abnormal MEN1 gene, which is passed on. And this patient, I've illustrated, has a problem with the pituitary gland, that's the dot at the top, the pancreas gland, as well as the, um, the parathyroid, as well as the pancreas. So this individual can actually pass on the gene to a, their son, let's say, yeah, for um, illustration. Whereas uh, this individual has the normal MEN1 gene and the normal MEN1 gene from the mother. And this can carry on. So you can get some individuals who are unaffected and some individuals that are. But it's a 50-50% chance in the majority of individuals. So how is the MN1 gene diagnosed? Well, there's three different ways to diagnose it. One, it can be due to a clinical diagnosis, meaning that an individual presents with abnormalities in the three Ps. And you just need two of those to make the actual diagnosis of MEN1 syndrome. So you can have a patient who has a problem with the parathyroid gland and the pituitary gland, or the parathyroid gland and the pancreas, or all three. Okay. Um, the other way to diagnose it is if there is a family history of MEN1. So an individual may come to our clinic who presents with a pituitary problem, but then tells us uh, that their family member is known to have the MEN1 syndrome. Okay. And the third way to diagnose it is actually through the genetic diagnosis. So we can take a blood sample to see whether that MEN1 gene is affected or not. And some individuals may have uh, an abnormality in the MEN1 gene, but do not develop those three P straight off. So they are called carriers meaning that they've got the abnormality, but they don't have the disease uh, at that stage. And then these individuals, we follow them up over a time course, uh, do various tests to make sure they don't develop problems with the pituitary gland, the parathyroid gland, or the pancreas. Okay. So, a lot of researchers have uh, tried to see what abnormalities occur in the MEN1 gene. And there are over 1,300 abnormalities detected. So there are lots of abnormalities. But at present, uh, there is no, what we say, genotype-phenotype correlation. And that means if there's an abnormality in the MEN1 gene, it cannot help me predict uh, what type of uh, pituitary problems or pancreas problems or parathyroid problems that individual may have. Okay? So... Um, that report you may see may show that there is a specific abnormality in the gene, but I cannot predict what's going to happen, let's say, 20 years down the line at the moment. Now, MEN1 is the most common familial endocrine syndrome, and about 1 in 30,000 individuals may have this condition. It affects all age groups, so patients can be affected at a young age, patients can be affected at an older age. The mean age of presentation is in the 40s, so in the fifth decade of life. So what I'm now going to do is concentrate on those three Ps, um, and I'm going to first focus on the most common problem, which is the parathyroid problem. And patients can present with a condition called primary hyperparathyroidism. So the first question you may be asking me is, where is the parathyroid gland? So, in the neck, in the middle, is uh, the thyroid gland. Um, it's a butterfly shape, and uh, this is the back of it. Okay? And there are four parathyroid glands on either side. Para means outside of the thyroid, and those glands can secrete a hormone called parathyroid hormone, or we say PTH. 
and in this condition the PTH is raised and that's something we can measure in the blood okay. so is PTH important well PTH is very important for the calcium balance in our body so if an individual has a high PTH then calcium can actually leak out of the bones so the bones can become a bit more fragile calcium can also come from the kidneys so normally we actually excrete or pass out a lot of calcium in our urine and PTH can actually try to keep that in so if someone has too much PTH then we keep a lot of calcium from being excreted into the urine and so the calcium can go up and sometimes PTH if we have too much PTH can activate vitamin D and I'm going to show you a slide about that in, in a bit uh, but if we have too much vitamin D in our body then we take a lot <coughs> of calcium in through the bowel through the gut so we absorb a lot of calcium when we eat so by having high PTH that causes your calcium level in the blood system to go high okay. so does that matter well it does because if the calcium is very high then you can present uh, quite unwell but most patients with MEN1 have a calcium which is a little bit raised when they present with this condition and what I've done here is list uh, all the symptoms or what you would be complaining of when you come in to see someone with a high calcium so if your calcium is a little bit raised you may be passing a little bit more urine you may be feeling a bit more thirsty you may be drinking a lot of water throughout the day you may be feeling a bit tired you may have some aches and pains you may be feeling a bit low in mood as well if your calcium is a little bit higher so moderately high then you can have problems with the gut so your appetite reduces you may be getting a bit small pain in the abdomen you may become constipated and if it's very raised then there can be some more complications that can occur if you have a very raised calcium it can affect your heart and the heart may beat a bit more regularly sometimes the pancreas can be inflamed so you may get something called pancreatitis which can present with abdominal pain but a lot of patients I see with MEN1 who have parathyroid problems typically present at this stage okay? or may not even know they've got the condition so they may be asymptomatic so it's very rare for this to happen in patients with MEN1. So I've said primary hyperparathyroidism is the most common uh, gland that's affected. Normally four glands are affected. So all, all those four around the thyroid gland can be affected. And if they're affected, then the real question is what should, should occur as a treatment in these patients? So firstly, patients may feel a bit unwell because the calcium is raised. And the age of onset is quite young, actually, 20. So patients may need to you know, live with this for a long period of their life. So the real question is, what should we do? And um, you can test the calcium in the blood. That can be slightly raised. You can test the PTH. That can be slightly raised you can look for complications of the raised calcium so I told you the calcium sort of comes out from, from those bones so you can do a scan of the bones to see if the bones are weaker than they are and that's called a DEXA scan so some of you may have had that and that looks at your bone density <coughs> we can also do a kidney scan as well so we can see if patients may get kidney stones because a lot of calcium is going through the kidneys um, and some patients may present with pain which radiates to the back and that's called renal colic okay. the actual localization of these glands is probably not that helpful before thinking about the treatment options available so if someone didn't have ME in one who saw me the first test I would do is probably an ultrasound of the parathyroid gland to see if one of those glands are enlarged or you can do a nuclear medicine scan to see if the function of those glands are slightly larger than not but in MEN1 as I said all four of those glands are affected 
So actually trying to localise the disease is not as uh, useful as someone who's got to not has have MEN1. So the real question is how many glands should be removed? So if I was to remove all four of the glands, then the problem is the body will not produce enough PTH. So the calcium may fall in, in the blood system. But if I only took out one of the glands, then there is a theoretical risk that the other glands are affected and then you will get that problem later on in life. So what most, well, most centres do is to remove uh, about three and a half uh, of those parathyroid glands uh, rather than all of those parathyroid glands. However, if all the glands are affected on presentation, then sometimes we need to remove all four of them. What used to happen, actually, was uh, that surgeons could actually transplant uh, part of the parathyroid tissue into the, into the arm, and that's called autotransplantation. And that would mean that there is a bit of parathyroid tissue which could produce a bit of calcium. But the problem is when we follow the patients up, uh, you know, many years down the line, then they can still get high calcium because this uh, can actually produce more PTH. And sometimes, uh, because it's embedded in the skin of the arms, it can be very difficult uh, to actually locate it. Uh, so a lot of centres don't, don't do that. So vitamin D, um, I was just saying to my colleagues here, we sh should have probably had this lecture outside because it's so sunny <coughs> and someone's here from Australia, is that right? Uh, no? Or Italy. Italy, yeah, so I'm sure your sun there is very good uh, and you've probably got enough vitamin D at the moment. Uh, but there's different ways to replace vitamin D. So I said PTH is important uh, for vitamin D activation. And this is the most common preparations of vitamin D. But if you've had a parathyroid operation and, those, and PTH is not being produced by the parathyroid glands, then your calcium can go very low. And actually, this is not the best form of vitamin D therapy. What we tend to prescribe our patients is something called 1-alpha calcidol. So that is the activated form of vitamin D. And the activation occurs in the kidneys. Okay? So because you're lacking PTH, vitamin D cannot be activated in the kidneys, and this is why the 1-alpha component is very important. Okay? So now I'm going to just briefly focus on the pancreatic side, but actually I'm going to focus more of this later on in, in, in the day. So just regarding the pancreatic side, uh, patients can get uh, problems in the pancreas which are functioning, so that could be a gastronoma or insonoma, or it could be non-functioning, or it could produce very rare hormones in the stomach. Okay? So that's all I want to say about the pancreas at this stage. So I'm going to focus on pituitary disease now, and a lot of my research has actually been done in pituitary disease, so I'm going to focus a little bit more of the talk on this. But the pituitary gland is located in the brain and it's a pea size, um, size and it's located right in the middle of the brain. And the pituitary gland is important uh, because there are various structures right near the pituitary <coughs> gland. So this is just a diagram, it's an MRI scan looking at the pituitary gland in the middle. And what's important is uh, above the pituitary gland uh, are the nerves which control your vision, so the optic nerves. And on either side of the pituitary gland are nerves that contain um, or control your eye movements, and that's located in something called the cavernous sinus. So normally most uh, um, abnormalities of the pituitary are small, sometimes they can grow and become larger, and if they become too large, it can affect the nerves of the eyes, and normally it's the peripheral nerves that are affected. So patients can present with problems uh, looking on left and right, uh, on the outside, or sometimes uh, there can be problems with eye movement. There's also nerves which contain sensation in that area as well. So some of my patients present uh, with sensory problems in the face as well. Okay? And what's very important in the cavernous sinus is there's an artery called the carotid artery. Um, and if there's a problem in the cavernous sinus, uh, 
then our treatments are not really surgery because you don't want a surgeon to go in there and you know touch the carotid artery because that's the major blood vessel to the brain we tend to think about radiotherapy in those in those patients okay. so um, I've just illustrated here what the pituitary gland produces so the pituitary gland is the orchestrator of all your pituitary hormones um, a lot of my cardiologists um, feel the heart is the most important organ in the body but as endocrinologists we always say the pituitary gland is the most important and the reason behind that uh, is the pituitary gland produces a vital hormone called ACTH and that works on the adrenal glands there are glands located above the kidneys to produce a hormone called cortisol and cortisol is one of the most vital hormones for life because if you're lacking cortisol then your blood pressure can go very low and you can become very sick. Okay. But the pituitary gland produces other hormones as well. So growth hormone, and growth hormone is very important in adults uh, for your muscles as well as your bones as well. But in children it's very important for growing. TSH is a hormone that works on your thyroid gland and your thyroid can produce thyroxine under the control of the TSH hormone. The sex steroid hormones are your FSH and LH. So in men, they produce testosterone because of this. In females, they can produce estrogen, the female type of hormone due to that. And then there's a hormone called prolactin. And actually in life, prolactin is not that important uh, unless you're pregnant. Uh, and it's very important for milk expression in, um, in pregnant uh, individuals. And there's always a hormone that everyone <coughs> forgets, which is antidiuretic hormone. And that's a hormone at the back of the pituitary gland. And normally it's not affected unless uh, you've had pituitary surgery. And in some patients, uh, the pituitary surgeon may need to go into an area which affects the back of the pituitary, the posterior pituitary, which means antidiuretic hormone is disrupted, it's not produced, uh, and antidiuretic hormones are very important to keep water in the body. So patients that lack antidiuretic hormone may pass a lot of urine and become very thirsty. And they get a condition called diabetes insipidus. So not diabetes mellitus, which is high sugar levels. They get diabetes insipidus, uh, which is a lack of this hormone, antidiuretic hormone. Okay. So... Um, what is the prevalence of pituitary tumours in MEN1? The first statement I'm going to make at the top may be a surprising statement. So if I took the whole population out there who did not have or does not have MEN1, actually one in four of individuals may have an abnormality of the pituitary gland. So it's more common than what we used to think. And that's because we're doing a lot of MRI scans now on individuals or CT scans for headaches for unknown reason, which are non-pituitary related. And you can pick up small things on the pituitary gland. But these um, enlargements of the pituitary gland may not cause any problems to that individual. Obviously, in MEN1, it's slightly different because uh, I've al already told you that the pituitary gland may be affected. So if the pituitary is enlarged, uh, at that stage then we would need to monitor that uh, throughout life uh, but certainly it's more common than we thought in terms of the general population who don't have MEN1 and the most common hormone that's produced uh, is prolactin in patients with MEN1 growth hormone can be produced in about 10% of individuals they don't produce a hormone and very rarely there can be excess amount of ACTH which produces a lot of cortisol. So in MEN1, the mean age of diagnosis of these pituitary abnormalities is in the 30s, late 30s, um, but can occur at a young age or at an elderly age. You may have heard of the terms microadenoma or macroadenoma, and you may not know what that means. So microadenoma are pituitary abnormalities that are less than one centimetre in size, whereas macroadenomas are greater than one centimetre in size. So it's just terminology. Macroadenomas are more likely to grow and cause problems with the visual fields 
or the cavernous sinus, which controls your eye movements, and the sensory part. Okay. So, I told you I did a lot of research in pituitary. So, my researcher was on a condition called familial isolated pituitary adenoma, which is not MEN1, but patients with this condition have problems with the pituitary gland only. So, this is one of the first families reported with the condition. It's a French family in the 1700s. And these individuals here at the back are brothers, and they have excess amount of growth hormone that occurs when they were younger. And I can tell you that because if someone has excess amount of growth hormone when they're young, the bones aren't fused at that time, and so they grow very tall. Okay? But these patients or these families only have problems with the pituitary gland. So they don't have problems with the uh, parathyroid or the pancreas gland. Okay? But what's important or what, what's interesting is that these patients have a problem in the AIP gene, which is located very close to the MEN1 gene. So the question is, is this a spectrum of the MEN1 gene um, or, or not? And uh, at the moment, we think these are two totally different conditions. But maybe if you find genes which are involved in this condition, they may be involved in MEN1. And the other bit I just want to show you um, is that we did a lot of research in families with this condition. And we have a lot of families from Northern Ireland with this condition. And if you go to the Royal College of Surgeons, which is just located just down the road in Holborn, you'll see an individual who was in the 1700s uh, who had uh, um, gigantism or excess amount of growth hormone as a child. And um, what we did was we took uh, the bone from the skeleton of this individual and actually found they were related uh, to a family member here who came from Northern Ireland. And that's on the BBC2 programme. So if you're interested in this condition, you may lo look into it. Uh, um, Good. So, what's going back to MEN1, so why is the pituitary so vital? So, if the pituitary gland enlarges, then it can cause problems with the vision, the cranial nerves, but also other um, cells in the body can be affected. So, you can get pituitary failure, meaning those other hormones may not be produced. And that is important because patients may have a condition called hypopituitarism, meaning that those vital hormones are not produced because the pituitary tumour has just got so, so enlarged. So this is the pituitary gland. Um, it's not showing that nicely here, and it's enlarged. It's a macroadenoma. And this individual here presented with problems with the vision as well as uh, um, a lack of some of those pituitary hormones. So what's important in patients who may present with problems of the vision is to do something called the visual field. And some of you may have had that. I can see some of you in the audience have glasses. So when you go to your opticians, uh, you probably get a visual field assessment. Uh, so you go into a globe and then you click onto a button every single time you see, see a, um, a flash of light. Uh, so this individual here is looking out at you. And where the black is located is the area that individual cannot see out of. So it's on the side of the vision. And the nose is located in the middle. So this is the temporal side, the latter, latter part of the vision. And one of our pituitary surgeons has now operated on this individual, and the vision has returned back to normal. Okay, so the black bits have almost disappeared. So if I ever see a patient uh, who has a pituitary problem, then I would like to do pituitary tests. Uh, and actually, those tests should really be done at a certain part of the, of the day. So we always like to do our tests early in the morning because a lot of our hormones uh, go up early in the morning as well. Um, and now some of you may not totally enjoy it because you have to come in at 9 o'clock in the morning. But the reason is uh, we're not being cruel. It's because uh, those hormones are much higher in the morning than later on in the day. Okay. So treatment options, pituitary surgery, medical therapy or radiotherapy for most problems with the pituitary gland. And I'm just going to go into um, each of the types 
of the pituitary problems. So if someone has excess amount of prolactin, then if that individual is a female individual, that patient may present with milk coming from the breast. So that's called galactorrhea. Some of my female patients may have problems with their periods as well. So they may get more irregular periods. Some of my male patients may have problems with erections or reduced libido because of increasing prolactin. And sometimes uh, patients can present with those problems with the vision due to the mass effect uh, of the pituitary tumour. Now, if someone has a problem with those other hormones, we can actually replace those hormones. So if someone has a problem with ACTH, the cortisol part of, of the hormones, which is the most vital hormone, then we can replace that with something called hydrocortisone. And some of you may be on hydrocortisone. So hydrocortisone we normally give three times a day. And that's because cortisol is highest in the morning and then goes down in the latter part of the day. So we tend to give it you know, when you first wake up, at midday and later on in the day as well. So we're trying to replicate the high cortisol going back to a low cortisol. If people lack TSH, then we can give patients thyroxine. If patients um, lack LH and FSH, those are the sex hormones in male individuals, then we can replace that with testosterone. In female individuals, we can give our female patients estrogen as well. And in our adult patients who are growth hormone deficient, <coughs> there is growth hormone therapy as well. So if someone has a prolactinoma, then the first investigation I would like to do is an MRI of the, of the pituitary. And that's to see if the pituitary gland is enlarged or not. Then we can think about treatment. And the treatment options are medical therapy. This is the one pituitary abnormality that can be treated with medications rather than pituitary surgery. And we tend to give medications which reduce the levels of prolactin in the blood system. So that is called a dopamine agonist, bromocryptine or cabergoline. Some of you may, may be on that already. It can cause nausea. So what I tend to tell my patients on bromocryptine is to try to take it in the middle of your meal, your main meal. So you can take half a um, sandwich or something, half a tablet, and then finish the rest of the tablet. So, and that can sort of settle down the, those nausea symptoms. Sometimes if the pituitary tumour is not responding to the medical therapy, then we can think of surgery or radiotherapy. Okay. And this is someone who has a prolactinoma, and that patient was treated with a dopamine agonist, and it sh has shrunk down. So it's very amenable to medical therapy. So non-functioning pituitary tumours do not produce any of those excess hormones. So patients can present at a very later stage with complications such as headaches, visual problems, or those cranial nerve problems, so the eye movement problems, or the sensory problems as well. And they may also present with failure of the other pituitary hormones. Okay. So treatment, generally speaking, if it's a large pituitary tumour, then we sometimes do surgery. But actually, we've done a lot of research on non-functioning pituitary adenomas, and sometimes they don't actually increase in size that dramatically. So you can think about watching and waiting rather than actually operating on a lot of these non-functioning pituitary adenomas. If they're very large, we can think of radiotherapy as well. Okay. So growth hormone secreting tumours, they cause complications due to excess amounts of growth hormone being produced, which then works on the liver to produce a protein called IGF-1 insulin-like growth factor 1. And some patients uh, in the audience who have acromegaly may have heard of the word IGF-1 is elevated. So that is a protein that is uh, elevated in the, in the liver. And we can measure that in the blood system. So if you have increased amount of IGF-1, it can cause problems with the soft tissues of the body. So the hands can become larger, the feet can become larger, 
the face can change as well. Okay? If this occurs in young individuals, then they can become very tall as well because the bones actually fuse when you're about 16 or 17. And if they don't fuse, then they carry on growing if there's excess amounts of growth hormone production. So sometimes um, patients can become very large. So this used to be the world's tallest individual. He was over eight uh, foot in height and he was from Ukraine and that's the Ukrainian president there as well. But there are treatment options for patients with <coughs> excess amounts of growth hormone production. So first of all, we tend to do a test uh, to see if patients have excess amounts of growth hormone. We do a test called a glucose tolerance test. We give individuals a sugary drink and measure glucose before and two hours later. And in patients who have excess amounts of growth hormone, the growth hormone does not suppress. We can also measure IGF-1 in the blood system, which is raised in patients with this condition. Patients can also be at risk of having diabetes or having problems with the cholesterol as well. So we can measure that in the blood. And we also do an MRI of the pituitary. So this is an individual with acromegaly who has a large pituitary tumour. And we can offer surgery or radiotherapy if it's very large. But sometimes we can think about medical therapy after pituitary surgery if it still, still occurs. And there are medications that can be given. You've probably all heard of somatostatin analogues, so landretide or octretide or um, sandostatin. It's normally given as an injection. Dopamine agonists, so that's the cabergoline or the bromocryptine, or a medication called pegvisamont, which is a growth hormone receptor antagonist. And again, this is a injection that's given every day. Okay. So I'm just going to move on to another hormone, which is the excess amount of ACTH. So if patients have excess amount of ACTH from the pituitary gland, they can get a condition called Cushing's disease. And that was named after an American individual, an American doctor, who described it uh, in the early part of the 1900s. And patients can present uh, with increasing weight. The weight is mainly central rather than on the arms. Patients may have bruising. Patients may have uh, uh, diabetes on presentation. And normally the muscles uh, which are closer to the trunk are affected, so the arms or, the, or, the, um, or these muscles here. And patients are at risk of diabetes or having problems with the heart. So again, investigation is to do a test uh, to try to suppress the excess amount of cortisol. So we give a medication called dexamethasone, which is a steroid, and we measure the cortisol level before the dexamethasone and then after the dexamethasone. And in patients who have too much cortisol, the steroid is not suppressed. Okay. Also, I said that the cortisol is highest in the morning and lowest in the evening. So sometimes we can bring patients into hospital and measure the cortisol late at night, and that's called a midnight cortisol. And if the midnight cortisol is high, then that's suggestive that so much cortisol is being produced throughout the day. You can measure that hormone ACTH, which can be elevated in the pituitary gland, and we can do an MRI of the pituitary as well. But the problem with an MRI is that uh, individuals with Cushing's disease uh, have very small pituitary abnormalities. And sometimes you cannot pick them up uh, on the MRI scan. So sometimes we need to actually sample the veins uh, around the pituitary <coughs> gland. Um, and we can take ACTH and measure that uh, and see whether it's coming from the pituitary or not. So treatments of Cushing's surgery is the number one treatment. If it's very large, we think of radiotherapy. There are also medications that can be used as well. And these medications, ketoconazole um, or metyrapone, can lower the cortisol levels in the body. Okay. So I've gone through the parathyroid. I've gone through the um, pituitary. 
Probably the most important question is when should we screen for these abnormalities in patients with MEN1? Um, and there is a very um, concise guidelines which have come from Dr. Newey over here on MEN1. Uh, I'm sure he will talk about this in his talk. But uh, if someone has a parathyroid abnormality, then probably the best age to screen is probably eight years onwards. And we can screen using a blood test, which is a blood test to look for the parathyroid hormone, the PTH hormone, as well as the calcium hormone. If someone has a pituitary problem, then we may need to think about doing blood tests at an early age, and that can involve doing a test for prolactin, which is the most common pituitary abnormality that can occur, or growth hormone, which can also occur as well. And then later on in life, maybe after the age of 10, we could think about doing a scan of the brain, an MRI of the pituitary, and then repeat it every so often, maybe three years, to sit, detect whether the pituitary gland is affected or not. Okay? But as I say, the majority of patients with pituitary problems, that actually occurs later on in life when they're in the late 30s. The parathyroid is the condition that occurs more at an earlier age, so in the 20s. Um, and that would involve a blood test for PTH and calcium. So, uh, a lot to take in this lecture, but hopefully I've tried to explain it uh, um, uh, as concisely as possible. But in summary, a lot of glands are affected in MEN1. The three glands that are commonly affected are your um, pituitary, your parathyroid, and your pancreas. And actually, regular blood tests and screening can pick up these problems at an early stage which can mean we can think about treatment options at a much earlier stage than later on.